you've been involved in various Havarot. Can you explain sort of what the Havara movement is? And yeah, of, I yeah. can. Um, so it's easy in a way because the Havara I've been involved in is the arguably the first of them, and Havara Shalom in Somerville, and and that came into being for two reasons. Uh, one is that there were a lot of young men, you know, fervently observant Jewish young men who didn't want to fight in the Vietnam War. So they founded a seminary, their own seminary. And for a long time, that was what Havara Shalom was officially designated as, Havara Shalom Community San uh, Seminary. And for a long time, the dues that people paid were called tuition. But also, uh, you know, they were people who found the structures of organized Judaism at the time empty of life. There just wasn't anything going on there. It was dead. and. dusty. And they made it up themselves. Uh, they, the Jewish catalogs, which are a kind of do-it-yourself Judaism and are in imitation of the whole earth catalog, are how do you make up a Judaism if you don't, if you're not being offered one by the structures available to you? So the Chavara Fellowship was, was an institution created to answer that question. Right? It's not accidental that it, its um, services take, that they bought a house. It was never going to be a synagogue-sized building. Uh, so they bought a house when you could buy a house in Somerville in the late 60s, and the congregation is still there, and the living room is the davening room, and the, what would have been somebody's bedroom in you know, the second floor is the library, and you know the dining room is where you have business meetings, and the cushions are what you sit on because people like the idea of sitting on cushions rather than chairs because there was a synergy between Eastern religion and, and Havara Judaism. Anyway, so I really know little about other Havarot, but, but that's the pattern for the one that is mine, which just had its 50th anniversary celebration. Um, and when did you join? That? So I joined in 2004, 2003, 2004, and the story of how I got there is for me at any rate interesting, so I'll tell you that story. Um, so my wife's a Quaker, as noted, and uh, I was going with one of our daughters the day before the first Seder to buy a fish at Wolf's Fish Market in Brookline, which is what I always did on that day, because I always cooked the same dish the first night, which is a, actually a French, a Provencal dish. But And, and on the way back, uh, Lily, the 10 minutes younger daughter, said to me, so tell me how it works out for you being a member of a congregation that doesn't accept me as a Jew. And I was, I was back at Harvard Hill at the time. Um, and uh, I thought about it. I, I, there's no way for me to convey this correctly. I know that's the question she asked, but it sounds confrontatory, and it wasn't. It was actually inquiring and curious, and I loved that. So I spent six months thinking about it. And I talked to Ben Cian uh, Gold, just ascertaining whether this was in fact the policy. And he had, he was had by then retired from being the advisor, but I cared for him very much and wanted to talk to him. I talked to Norman Janus, who was the, his successor in that role, and who was also a close friend. And then I thought, you know, it doesn't. She's right; it doesn't work. So I wrote a regretful letter, and then thought, where am I going to go now? Because I was, I was used to going in. I'd li I like services, and I like conversations, and I like observance. You know, it's, I, at the time, my wife and I went into Cambridge together on Saturday mornings, and she got off at Central Square for her Tai Chi class, and I stayed on the red line till Harvard Square for my davening. We were both going to our spiritual exercise. I had heard of Chavarat Shalom because I knew, it was because people had told me that it didn't charge for admission to the high holiday services, and also that it had done sanctuary work during the Contra Wars. And I thought, well, if this is a congregation that might work for me, then I would just have to stay on the red line for two stops more, and we could continue meeting on the way home. Yeah transportationally efficient. So I got in touch with him and I said, the first thing I have to know is what are your views on the children of 
of intermarriages. And I got an email back from somebody I didn't know at the time, obviously, but have come to know and like very much, saying, well, our position is that people who identify as Jewish are Jewish. And by the way, if your wife would like to come to services sometimes, she'd be more than welcome. And I thought, fine, that sounds great. So I showed up and <clears throat> one summer morning, and it, I'm realizing, by the way, as I'm talking, that a, an important leitmotif of this story is the number of times I've been attracted to something that was difficult and disorienting from chapel choir to, as it's going to turn out, to Chavra Shalom. Because the thing about Chavra Shalom, I, I was, it was a Hebrew liturgy, and I was entranced by that because I thought the only people who would accept our kids as, as Jews are Reformed Jews, and they mostly don't have Hebrew liturgies, and it's not going to be participatory, and I'm not going to get to do what I do at Harvard, and, and how am I going to work that out? Anyway, so here's the congregation that would, and it has a Hebrew liturgy, and I think hallelujah, except that I can't read it because it's all been rewritten, or to a significant extent been rewritten along gender lines and names of God lines and ways of referring to non-Jews lines and certain modes of violence lines. And I couldn't, I mean, I could read part of it, but then every time something, I began to feel that I was in a familiar place, the text had been changed and I was suddenly in an unfamiliar place. And I thought, what? Which is partly just not having very good Hebrew at the time and, and not knowing the feminine forms for all these verbs, but also there were bigger changes than that. But I found that, too, to be really attractive. I found it politically attractive. I like the idea of written liturgy, but I found it philologically attractive. I like the fact that I have to learn more grammar <laughs> in some way. And, I liked the, and there was a fervor to it. There was um, an non-anonymity. I, I like being places where you can't hide in the woodwork. So, so anyway, then one thing led to another. I, I stayed and learned how to lead services and eventually learned how to lane there, which I had never done for obvious reasons. And so that's the, that's that story. <laughs>